Okay, yeah, let's just get right on it. So I'm Rüdiger from number zero, and I'm going to talk about uh, BAO. It's kind of a mix of a hashing algorithm and a data tra transfer protocol that is related to the Blake 3 hashing algorithm. And I'm going to try to explain why this is so awesome. Um, so let's just get on it. First of all, there was a, there was a decision uh, at Arrow to um, kind of rethink things from the ground up. And, uh, well, we try to keep things extremely simple. The reason for that is that uh, we are a very small team and we want to put things into production as quickly as possible. So we cannot afford a lot of complexity. Um, and this is kind of our, our guideline to, to make things really as simple as you can. So like if you take one thing away, it just doesn't work anymore. And okay, so the outline is first basically what primitives does the new arrow offer? Then uh, what do we want out of this? Um, how does BAO enable this? And uh, then some applications where this works very well and some other applications where it doesn't work very well. And last but not least, the discussion about whether this can still be considered IPFS or not. Because as you'll see, it is quite a departure to some things. Uh, but let's just see what it does. Okay, so what primitives do we have? Um, so the project was started very uh, in the beginning of this year, and it's already used in Delta Chat. And so there is not much in terms of primitives. Um, so let's see, what, what do we got? We got blobs. So blobs uh, can be arbitrary size. You can have a blob that is one byte, you can have a blob that is one terabyte, it doesn't matter. If it fits on your hard disk, it can be an arrow blob. Uh, so there's no limit of four, four megabytes or whatever. Um, and we use the file store pattern by default. I mean, people that use Kubo are probably familiar with that. It means that the file itself stays in the hand of the user. So if you have a large data set, you might want to work with the data set and still provide it to other people. And then it's quite useful to have the data available at the same time as sharing it. Like if you have a big machine learning data set and you want to play with it, but you also want to share it, then it's not good if you have to have it twice on your disk. Uh, and this is the default for, for IRO. We don't do anything else. Um, then we have a concept called collections. That's kind of the smallest things we could, uh, thing we could come up with to, to combine multiple blobs. And what's a collection? A collection is a blob. It's clear. We only have blobs, so collections are just blobs. A uh, collection is, can be thought as a sequence of links with some metadata. There is some discussion about whether we need that, but currently there is some metadata. And a collection, just like a blob, can be as big as you want. So if you want a collection with one billion links, it's no problem. You can do it. It's like 32 billion bytes. It's no big deal. Um, and typically, links go to blobs. You could have links to collections, but so far we don't do that. So far we just have the two level hierarchy. A collection contains blobs and that's it. And um, yeah, like Hannah mentioned, uh, no dark, no problem. Uh, and we use, this might also be a bit controversial, we use the same hash algorithm for all links in the collection. And currently the only hash algorithm that we support is Blake 3. Um, so we, just, we get to why we uh, do that. So uh, what do we want with these two primitives? We, we basically just want one thing, which is verified streaming. Um, meaning we want to send content over the wire only if it was requested due to a hash, and we never want to send something which does not match the hash. Um, and we want incremental verification, meaning that you should not have to download a huge amount of stuff. You should, be, you should notice very early if somebody sends you wrong data, either due to a bit flip in, on the wire or due to malice or whatever. Should be, uh, should be able to notice that immediately. And we want to validate on send and on receive. So validation is good, let's do it everywhere. Um, and so this is a typical collection. This is one uh, data set I've been playing with a lot of times. Uh, and it's a typical machine learning data set. It has some very small files that is uh, 100 bytes and some very large files, uh, 12 gigs. And uh, we don't need to split this up into a tree or anything. We just have the collection and the blobs. Uh, I mean, there are still trees, you'll see, but uh, they are kind of uh, an implementation detail. Um, okay, so now let's take a look at what we want to do with these collections. So 
uh, the data transfer protocol. So first of all, it is a request response protocol. So all the all this uh, ceremony about who uh, who is it from, who is it for, and, and so on, it's all taken care of because it's request re response. Um, it is specifically not a discovery protocol. So I actually go to go to great length to make sure that nobody can abuse it as a discovery protocol. It's just about you know the other side has the data and you want it and you want to say I want this data, give it to me. There will be a discovery protocol, it will look similar, but this is not a discovery protocol. Um, and again, verified streaming and uh, on send on receive. So what, what are the possible things that people might want to do? Um, so the first thing, of course, you have a hash and you want the data. That's what BitSwap does. Uh, so you have a hash and you want all the data that is uh, behind that hash. And that would, of course, be a bit limited if you have a giant piece of data so the next thing we want to support is the ability to say, I want some ranges of this data. Like, uh, the, you know, HTTP range request where you say, I have a big asset and I specify which part of the data I want. And that's one thing we support. Um, and we support not just one range, but multiple ranges. So whatever complexity of the part of the data you want, uh, you can specify it. Um, okay, then once you go to the level of collections, the most obvious thing you might want to do is you want the entire collection. So in these uh, diagrams, blue is always what you already have and green is what you want. And this is the simplest case. You have, uh, you have a hash and you want everything below this hash. But it turns out that this is, would be very limited if this was all we could do. So I got a few other scenarios. So this is resume. Basically, you have, you have made a download and you were interrupted in the middle, and then you basically got the, the, the collection itself. You got a, few, a bunch of files, but you were in the middle of the second file, you were interrupted. So you want exactly the rest and nothing more. And you need to be able to specify, I want like the, the second part of the big file, uh, number two, and the, the last file. So that's one thing the thing needs to be able to support. But it gets more complex. So this is repair. Imagine you have a big data set, but for some reason you have some uh, break, uh, breakage, a bit flips, or you deleted some files or whatever, and you want to be able to specify, give me exactly the blocks that repair this data set to make it, uh, make it whole again, to make it conform to the hash again. And then you might get some very complex uh, like ranges. And uh, this is another scenario. Uh, this is multi-party data transfer. You have a big data set. Uh, you want it, and you have multiple peers that announce that they have it. And then you want to kind of shift the load on the different peers. So you say, you, you do first half, you do the other half. And then you, you might get some sort of stripe pattern or whatever. I mean, what, how exactly this looks like uh, is up to the uh, higher level algorithm. But this is basically uh, what you might end up with. And uh, so these are the scenarios that we need to support. So how does a request look like? Um, a request contains a root hash, of course, it's content addressed. And then it contains ranges for each element. Um, so the collection, as I mentioned, is just a blob. So we treat the collection as first element. And for the collection, just like for any other blob, you can, uh, you can specify ranges. So you can say, I'd, imagine you have a collection which con contains a billion links. You might not want to download the entire collection. So for the collection itself, you can also specify ranges. And then, Everything basically in the order in which the links appear in the collection, uh, you specify then the ranges for each element. And this is a little bit compressed. There is a, there is a range encoding which basically compresses uh, multiple ranges. Uh, so you end up with smaller numbers. And then there's another encoding which uh, uh, encodes multiple ranges. But well, if you are interested in deep details, then ask me in the, in the hallway or look in the repo. But let's just say it's very compact. And uh, now, once you get the to the response, so what, do you, what is the response? Um, the response is just um, the data that you've requested in a certain order, and the natural order is, of course, the collection first, and then all the elements in the collection um, in the order in which they appear in the collection. And, uh, well, okay, so let's see what the response is. It's just the concatenated response for each non-empty item. So if you have an, uh, non uh, if you have an empty item, uh, you don't need to send anything. The requester knows what he requested. So uh, the, the, you can only make sense of the response if you are the requester and know the request. 
That's important, but you can do it because it's a request response protocol. You can assume in a request response protocol that the requester knows what he has requested. Um, and now, okay, you could say just send the bytes, but that would be pretty weak because that would not be verified streaming. Uh, that would be would mean you would have to download everything and then hash it once it is all on, on your disk and uh, then find out, oops, I downloaded the wrong thing. And uh, so that, that's exactly when, when Wow comes in. So what is Bao? Uh, Bao is uh, basically an extension of the Blake 3 hashing algorithm. Uh, the Blake 3 hashing algorithm is a relatively new and relatively fast hashing algorithm. Uh, there are some controversial properties, but I'm not going to go into them. Uh, but the main thing is it is a cryptographic hash function um, and it is using an internal ephemeral Merkle tree. Um, this happens to be a binary Merkle tree that is kind of left balanced and it has the smallest addressable element is one kilobyte chunks. And now this uh, sounds pretty abstract, so I got some pretty pictures. Uh, this is a Blake 3 tree. So uh, below these white rectangles are the content and uh, then basically whenever you, we have a chunk, so you, here we have two chunks and we, we compute the hash for each chunk make a hash pair out of it, and then the, the hash of these two hashes is the, the, um, the hash of the, um, uh, of the entire content. This is how Blake 3 works internally. So for a single piece, it's very simple. You just hash the thing and that's your result. But as soon as the tree gets bigger, you build this internal tree. I guess for another audience, I would have to spend a lot of time explaining this, but here I think it's uh, pretty common, uh, this kind of thing. Um, so you end up with some kind of left, uh, left packed uh, binary tree. And as you can see, you have only two things in this tree. You're, you only have chunks and hash pairs. So hashes always appear in pairs and these hashes are 32 bytes. So these, uh, you always have these 64 byte hash pairs. And so this is how the tree looks when you have a, a larger number of chunks. Uh, as you can see, the thing at, above is the, is the final hash. This is what you get if you just do Blake 3 hash. Uh, and all the, um, all the intermediate nodes are ephemeral. They are just, just used during the calculation of the, of the final hash, but they are not stored anywhere. So you got a bunch of data, you do this nice tree, but then you throw away the key and just keep the result. That's what Black 3 is. And I think Black 3 is supported by Kubo, but only in this mode where you can just hash the whole thing. But if you do that, you're kind of missing out because Bao, Bao, what is Bao? Bao is exactly the same as Blake 3, except, um, so it is Blake 3. You get the same hashes, but uh, you persist the tree. Um, and that means that you can save some calculations. So you don't have to build the tree every time you need some, to do something with the data. And uh, there's two ways to use Bao. One is basically uh, you store this tree in a single separate file in a certain order and this is referred to as an outboard, or you, you kind of mix the hashes with the data. And we are using the outboard version because we want to leave the original data unchanged. So you want, you want you be, to be able to use your data while you share it. And so here we see this is basically Blake 3, except that you keep the tree. And uh, as you can see, the outboard file is just a list of hashes of hash pairs to be precise with the size prefix. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else, no metadata, nothing. And uh, the, the outboard obviously is much, much, much smaller than the data itself. Um, this is not the scale. Um, and in what order is the stuff stored? Well, uh, you basically store it in exactly the order in which you would need it to verify it. So the first thing you store is the two, two hashes immediately below the root because these are the hashes that you would ha have to hash to check that it actually meshes the root. And then, and so on, and so on. And this is called uh, the depth first left to right pre-order traversal. And uh, this is exactly how the, how the output is laid out. So the output is a single file. It is not some database, not some giant uh, complex thing. It's just a single file where the offset can be easily calculated based on where you are in the tree. Um, Okay, so now we got this great tree. Uh, how do, does this enable us to do verified streaming? Uh, so we don't want to do verified streaming of the entire thing. 
We also want to be able to do verified streaming of ranges, small and large ranges. So let's take a look. So on the provider side, you get the request and you figure out which tree you need. That's pretty clear. Uh, and then you basically have to look at the tree and traverse only the relevant part of the tree. So everything in the tree that is not relevant for the query, you can just ignore. Which also means that if you don't have that data, it's no big deal. Uh, it's only a big deal if you don't have any of the data that was requested. So you can share data which you, you, which you have partially downloaded. Um, and the traversal, again, is in pre-order. And then all you need to do is you basically take data out of the outboard file, take data out of the data file, mix it, send it over the wire. That's all you need to do. It's as fast as you could possibly imagine. Um, so this is how it looks. Here we got a tree. It's not, an, uh, it's not a perfect binary tree, but it's kind of left packed. That's how they always look. And down there, we got the ranges that we want to request. So the, 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 most, the smallest unit in BAO is a chunk. Chunk is uh, one kilobyte. So the first thing we do is round up the ranges to chunks. So we get one chunk on the left and two chunks on the right. And uh, the next thing, we need to figure out which part of the tree actually is relevant for this query. Just throw away everything that is not relevant. And um, then, we just need to traverse this in the right order and send it over the wire. That's all we need to do. And this is the order, obviously first to root because that's, the, that's what the remote needs first to validate. And then we basically take, make a path from the root to the, to the leaves. And this is the order in which we need to send the data. Um, there's not much to it, basically. Um, there's one thing we also validate when we send the data. The reason for that is that uh, this is data that is in a user directory, and the user might have changed it. So we don't want to lie, we want, don't want to send wrong data to the, over the wire, so we validate on send, and if the user has changed it, I mean, people, we tell people, don't change your data while you share it, but people will do it anyway, so if you verify on send, we will notice. Um, and now, this is kind of interesting, what happens on, on, on the requester side? Um, there is no metadata, there is no header, now comes a, now comes a hash pair, now comes a chunk or, or anything like that. Uh, but the requester knows exactly what to expect because the requester knows the shape of the tree. So the requester knows which ranges here it has requested and the requester knows the shape of the tree. So it does the exact same thing, it does the exact same tree traversal. Um, so first of all, it reads the size, then it knows the shape of the tree, and then it does the exact same thing as, uh, as what is done on the, on the sender side. Uh, and the, the, the tree iterator kind of tells you what to expect. Okay, the tree iterator says, now comes a pair, then you read 64 bytes, treat them as a pair, validate them, and so on. And the tree iterator tells you, now comes a chunk, then you read a chunk, validate it, and um, do whatever you want with it, basically. And you will detect corruption after one item. So at most, after one kilobyte, you will detect if somebody is lying to you. Uh, okay, in summary, so the provider traverses the tree, reads from data and output, validates and writes to socket, whatever. We use quick, but it is not a part of this uh, talk which exactly the transport is. And the receiver does basically the same thing, except uh, the receiver set doesn't have the data yet. Uh, it traverses the tree, uh, to know what to expect, then reads from the socket and validates, and then it uses the data in whatever, store or process or stream to the video or whatever. Um, okay, performance. So Blakery is a very fast hash function, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is how this all is optimized in terms of data layout. So no matter how big your data is, you're only dealing with two files. You're dealing with a very small file, which is called an outboard, and a possibly very large file, which is your actual data. And uh, in these two files, you have a very sequential access pattern. If you request the whole thing, it will just read the files from, from the beginning to the end, both the output and the data. And if you have a range request, it will um, only seek forward, it will never seek backward, and it will only seek forward once for each gap, basically. And for the outboard, it will also, see, also only seek forward. And in the worst case, it will seek forward the number of uh, levels in the tree. So also no big deal. 
And this is as close, uh, I mean, this was very important back when we, were, when we had spinning this. But even solid state disks like if you have a predictable access pattern because they also have caches and so on and they like if, if you behave in a certain way because then they can uh, prefetch stuff for you. So this is really, in terms of I.O., this is as close as to optimum as you can get. Um, and currently our performance limit is quick and encryption. Uh, it's the, the actual transfer itself, uh, I mean the computation itself is almost free basically. Um, and we can validate on send because it's so cheap. And there's another talk called measuring on the fast track. I think it's happening right now. So uh, if you want, you can watch the replay to see uh, the performance numbers. Um, okay, now let's talk about the overhead. Uh, so in the best case, best case is you have a giant file and you request it all. The overhead is 1 256 of the data size uh, due to some things we've done. And so for a one terabyte file, you would have a four gigabyte of overhead. And this overhead consists entirely of the hashes. So there's nothing else, no, no like headers or whatever, just hashes and data. That's all there is. And the hashes are 256. Now let's talk about the worst case. The worst case is you have a giant file and somebody requests a single chunk. In that case, you have to kind of build a path from the root to this chunk. And that means the number of parent uh, uh, nodes, so the number of hash pairs you have, is locked to the number of chunks. And so to put a number on it, it's like two kilobytes. So this would be interesting if somebody has a large file, one terabyte file, and uh, announces it on the network, and you just want to probe whether it's actually true. Like you, you ask for a random sample of the file to see if this party actually has the data or not. Uh, or if you want a tiny bit, bit of the data, I don't know, random access, whatever. Um, and in both cases, the overhead is not very large. Um, totally acceptable. Uh, but to, to get to this point, we actually had to modify the BAO algorithm a little bit. Um, so we are doing a thing called chunk groups. Um, so the original BAO algorithm has the tree built for every chunk. So every, for every chunk, you have a hash. And in total, you have two hashes per chunk, so you have 64 bytes for each kilobyte, which is 1 16th, which is a bit much. So if you have a one terabyte file, you would have a 64 gigabyte output, which would mean that you could not keep it in memory. And we want to keep it in memory. So we did something, um, uh, we implemented something that actually the original author also thought about. Um, we all only store higher levels of the tree. So, um, let's take a look how this works. Uh, you have this tree, and now I've uh, numbered the levels. So you got level zero are the leaves, uh, one leaf for each two chunks, and number one, number two. And now uh, you can basically treat the lower levels as ephemeral and the higher levels as uh, persistent. And if you do this and this, as you can see, um, you, uh, uh, your output gets smaller and you can afford then to keep your outputs in memory. I mean, there is of course also a downside because you have to, if you want to do something within one of these uh, kind of uh, chunk groups, you have to recompute the hashes. But as I mentioned, Blake 3 is very fast, so recomputing the hashes only has to be done for queries that are so small that they are below one chunk, uh, below one chunk group size, and it's very fast, so don't worry about it. Um, okay, applications. So what can you do with this? Um, one thing we are doing already is the database sync on mobile platforms. So basically we have a, also a talk uh, called Data Chat and Arrow. Um, the application is that you have a database on a phone of a chat app and you want to sync the database to a new device. Uh, that's one thing that's already in production. Then the next thing that I really like is machine learning data sets. Um, they really uh, have a mixture of small and very large files, and for them this works very well. And Git large file storage would also be an application, and game assets, as mentioned in the talk before, and directory trees, we can also do very large directory trees, because collections can contain uh, an arbitrary number of links, and we are mapping uh, deep directory structures to a single collection. 
So there are no collections in collections. You just have one big collection, which is the entire directory structure. Um, and you can also share disk images. If you have a giant disk image and you want to get it on a different machine, this is one of the fastest ways you can do it. Um, and here, I'm basically, I got a demo of adding uh, this uh, Llama 13B dataset to, uh, to IRO. This is not network, this is just building of the outboard. And as you can see, it's pretty fast. It's uh, more than one gigabyte per second, and uh, it's just very smooth. It doesn't even cost much CPU. I mean, you won't, your machine won't slow to crawl in, with this because it's just not doing that much. Um, yeah, future plans. So, wait a second, there should be a section about where it doesn't work well. Anyway, um, so future plans are, one thing you can do is, um, if you have a collection or a blob and you append data, um, you can reuse most of the three. Um, so you can think about, let's say, a log file. Log file, which, you, uh, which is append only, and you want to share the log file. Um, the, an application would be basically you, you have already transferred most of the log, and then you compute the new hash for the new log, and uh, basically transfer only the delta. Um, this can work for blobs and for collections. And then one thing that is a little bit further in the future is arbitrary writes. So you have a file, and you write anywhere in the file, uh, you recompute the, the root hash, and then you basically send this over the wire, and uh, basically um, only need to transfer the delta. So imagine you have a database, a live database, which is a single big file, and this gets modified all over the place, and then you can sync that to another place um, with very low overhead. And uh, so this is DB images, and you could even think about having a, mutable, a complete mutable file system uh, that you sync on another device. You, so you could sync your def, uh, SDA, whatever. Um, but single writer is something we are going to keep. We are not going to uh, tackle multi-writer. That will be a layer on top of this. Uh, okay, limitations, there it is. So where does this not work very well? Um, so if you have a deep and high, highly dynamic DAC, this is not going to work well for you. I mean, there's nothing fundamentally that, that makes this slower than anything of the existing stuff, but uh, we um, encourage people to have um, flat hierarchies because it's just so much better for transfer. And so Rabin chunking, for example, we don't support. Our chunk size is always one chunk, is one, uh, one kilobyte. And probably trees, there could be some ways to make them work, but it's going to be a little bit difficult. And um, so you can put collections in collections. You can put, create a hierarchy as deep as you want, but currently we don't have a garbage collection that is aware of this. So if you have a garbage collection that is not aware of it, it would just throw away all your, all your deck except for the first level. And that would not be good, obviously. And, uh, but I'm going to make the case that actually this uh, uh, caring that much about these um, very complex DAGs is not as common as you might think. So here's the Linux kernel. I just uh, took the Linux uh, kernel as a car file and did some analysis on it. So the total size of branches is about four megabyte and the total size of all leaves is 1.2 gigabyte. So the branches are just a tiny fraction of the leaves, uh, meaning that if you have a way to transfer the leaves in a quick way and put the rest in a single collection, you're not going to lose that much unless the data set is extremely dynamic. Here's another example, uh, Wikipedia. I didn't take the whole Wikipedia, but I took a small subset, just the math part, just so I could compute some stats. Branch size is three, whatever, uh, 32, 33 megabytes. And leaf size is again a factor of 100 more. So. All this DAC stuff only happens in this 1%, which is the branches. So I would argue that for many, many use cases, just forget about all this stuff, put your leaves, make sure you can transfer your leaves quickly, and put all the, all the DAC stuff just in a single collection. And here's the data set where it doesn't work. This is uh, something from Filecoin. And there you have a small test uh, data set from Filecoin. And there you have the vast majority of the data is in branches. So this would be something which we just cannot do currently. Um, okay, 
So now, uh, it's too late, but the, the question is, is this still IPFS? Um, so if you take the view that IPFS is something that has all these things, or that has the majority of these things, then this is definitely not IPFS, no way. Um, we, don't, we have equivalence to most of these things, but we don't have, uh, I mean, this is not what we are doing. But if you take this wider view, IPFS is everything where content addressing is baked in at the very, very low level, and everything works with content addressing, uh, then most definitely what we're doing is IPFS. Because there's not a single byte going over the wire that is not in some way related to a hash that came before. It just you do a single bit flip anywhere and it will immediately blow up. So, content addressing, every single byte that goes over the wire is content addressed, and uh, we got incremental verification at a very, very fine-grained level, even fi more fine-grained than, uh, than UnixFS, by the way, because in UnixFS you will download a directory block which can be up to 200k in size before you notice that it's wrong, and in our case it's on chunk or chunk group level. So it's much, very, very fine-grained incremental verification. And we don't even trust the file system because it's in the hand of the user. So if the user modifies a file, um, we have to check whether it's actually still the same. So we even validate the stuff that we, re we read from the file system. And that's why I would argue that it is very, very much in the spirit of IPFS, even though it doesn't have some of the primitives. And that's it. So, questions, or do we have time for questions? Hi, um, we worked on some best stuff last year, so I'm really, really excited to see this going into prod. Um, the thing where you throw out the lower levels is smart. We were about to change the chunk size, but um, which is bad, obviously. So uh, my question is for support, for mixing this with like Rabin content defined chunking. I don't, have you guys put any thought into the different options, like you could decide to throw Blake 3 out, you could wrap and chunk and then bow, um, you could wrap and chunk the inboard bow format, like there's a lot of options and all of them are kind of bad, like have you, are you guys just not going to do content defined chunking? Yeah, so like I said, this is in the big topic of uh, DAG uh, support, I think we have some ideas how to do it, so I mean transferring the individual uh, wrap and chunk pieces would still be very fast with this. Um, the, the thing is that we are a small, a small team and we are really going to look for applications where we have a revenue potential, let's put it that way. Uh, and uh, so if there's something where we say, if we can make this little piece work, um, we're going to have revenue, we're going to do it probably, but uh, we're not going to do something just in case somebody might need it at some point in the future. So that, that's all there is to it. How exactly we're going to do it, I can talk to you later. It's a bit more complex. Okay. So thanks a lot.